Hi, I'm Scott Amara Thaler. Welcome to a Rooftops of the Solar System observation. Little stories and anecdotes about the planets that just didn't fit in with their respective episodes. Before we get into this one, take a moment to click that red subscribe button below and the bell icon next to it for all the latest updates from Rooftops of the Solar System and Rooftops of America. Halfway between Mercury and the Sun, you will find a small, rocky world, orbiting around 16 million miles from our star. It is a red, scorched planet, but difficult to see, though you can tell it's there because of the influence it has on Mercury's orbit. Not only that, but we can prove it, based on detailed and precise mathematical calculations. Its name is Vulcan. Now, if you had rattled that off in the mid to late 1800s, it would have been accepted as truth. Ever since Mercury had been observed and recorded, it had presented something of a riddle to astronomers. Its orbit didn't line up with the mathematics or celestial mechanics being used at the time. To get a bit more specific about this, we need to talk about a few terms. The first is a bit about the dominant mathematics and physics of the time. In particular, the work of one Sir Isaac Newton. It's not an understatement to say that Newton, and his works in many fields, has greatly influenced our society even to this day. Newton is one of the great minds of human history, and I could spend hours talking about him, his works, and the impact they had on Western thought and science. But what I'm most interested in today is Newton's views on gravity and celestial mechanics, or in other words, how things move about in space. Newton's law of universal gravitation is usually stated is that every particle attracts every other particle in the universe with a force that is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. Simply put, the bigger an object is, the more gravitational attraction that it has. And then, the further you move away from said object, whether large or small, the less gravitational attraction it will exert. Even better, you can calculate both of these. So let's take a look at the Sun and Mercury. While vastly different in both size and mass, they do actually affect each other gravitationally. And this is most noticeable in Mercury's orbit, which leads us to precession, the second term that we need to define. So what is precession? Well, the simple definition is it's the slow movement of the axis of a spinning body around another axis due to a torque acting to change the direction of the first axis. All planets have a bit of precession as they orbit around our star, but for our sake, perhaps an easier way to understand this is with a visual demonstration. Think of it like a top spinning round and round on a table. As it spins, it makes looping patterns, and it's those patterns that's the precession. For the top, it derives from the gyroscopic effect of the spin. For planets, though, it actually comes from the gravitational pull, or torque, of our Sun, the most massive object in our solar system. Using Newton's formulas, astronomers were able to calculate all the observable planets' precessions, 
In the case of Mercury, though, something was off. Mercury was being more influenced than it should be, and the calculations being off by about 7%. It was clear that something else was affecting it. In 1840, the director of the Paris Observatory asked a up-and-coming French astronomer, Urbain Le Verrier, to study the problem of Mercury's orbit. Le Verrier was fashioning himself into something of an expert on celestial mechanics, and he wasted no time getting to work. By 1843, he was publishing papers on Mercury's precession. In 1846, a breakthrough of major proportions occurred. A new planet was discovered. Not Vulcan, but at the other end of the solar system, Neptune. Le Verrier, using only observations of Uranus and Newtonian celestial mechanics, was able to explain the small discrepancies between Uranus's observed orbit and its predicted orbit. Armed with this crucial bit of information, he was then able to calculate where the supposed planet should be. He rushed these calculations off to Berlin for observation, and the night they were received, astronomers Johann Gall and Heinrich de Rest pointed their telescope to the sky. And sure enough, within one degree, where Le Verrier said it would be, was revealed our eighth planet, Neptune. This was emphatic validation that Newtonian celestial mechanics worked. The Mercury precession problem bore similarities with the Neptune discovery, and Le Verrier would put to use the same techniques. The common view of space at the time was it was basically nothing. And so it was clear to Le Verrier that something had to be there pulling on Mercury. But what that was was still uncertain. In 1859, a French physician and amateur astronomer named Edmond Modeste Lescarbot claimed to have seen a transit of the hypothetical planet. He wrote down the details and sent them to Le Verrier, who in turn arrived unannounced and interrogated Les Carbeau, who described exactly what he had observed. For Le Verrier, this was just another bit of proof, and he became enraptured with the idea of a celestial body existing between the Sun and Mercury. Now, asteroids were one suggestion, but what was even more appealing was the thought that this was a planet. And Le Verrier took to calling that object Vulcan, after the Roman god of fire. While there were doubts about the veracity of, of Les Carbeau's claim of a planetary transit, he wasn't lying. He had definitely spotted something. Le Verrier used the French physician's observations to calculate Vulcan's distance from the Sun at 13 million miles, with an orbital speed of 19 days, 17 hours. This kicked off a sensation, the hunt, for our next planet in our solar system. And reports started to come in from all over the place, from both amateur and professional astronomers some more reliable than others, but each offering a potential clue and new data point. As for the unreliability of them, well, that was just chalked up to the general difficulty of observing anything near our sun. It was the heyday for planet Vulcan. It was written on the charts, had detailed calculations made about it, and while there may have been doubts by some of its existence, that didn't stop astronomers from looking for it. Le Verrier, though, wouldn't live to see the final act. 
He passed away in Paris in 1877, never knowing for sure if Vulcan existed or not. In 1915, another breakthrough occurred. This one, not by an astronomer, but a physicist. That year, a groundbreaking paper was published, one that would revolutionize physics, astronomy, celestial mechanics, and our understanding of one of the fundamental forces of our universe, gravity, much as Newton had centuries before. It also spelled doom for the existence of Vulcan. When Albert Einstein published his theory of relativity in 1915, it provided a new understanding of gravity, different from the Newtonian one used by Leverrier. Einstein, with his model, was able to calculate in detail the precession of Mercury, which, in turn, validated his theory. One of the biggest findings was that space isn't an empty nothing. It's something. And it turns out that as Mercury moves closer to the Sun, the effects our star has on gravity and space becomes more apparent. And it was this local effect of our very star that had warped Mercury's precession. Einstein's theory of relativity effectively corrected the flaw in Newton's gravity equation and would prove to be one of the final nails in the coffin for the planet Vulcan. The theory of relativity was later empirically proven in 1919 during a solar eclipse when scientists were able to measure the bend in the sun's light. Astronomy, physics, and science itself were entering in a new age. While Vulcan may not exist, it has raised a question of why not? Particularly as we've expanded our celestial horizons with modern technology and are now able to make observations beyond our solar system. While we've figured out the riddle of Mercury's precession, it does bring up another question on why we don't have an inner planet or inner planets between the Sun and Mercury. In some ways, our solar system is a bit of an odd duck compared to the others that we've observed. More than a few exoplanets orbit exceptionally close to their respective stars, to the point that if you were to take Mercury and put it in those systems, it would be considered an outer world. One system, Kepler-11, has five planets, all with orbits closer to their star than Mercury is to our Sun. So what gives? Well, it seems to have to do with how our solar system was actually formed. In particular, there's two factors at play here on why we don't have a planet like Vulcan between the Sun and Mercury. The first of those factors is the actual energetic nature of our Sun itself. While we think of our Sun as a dynamic entity today, it has mellowed out in its middle age. Our star is believed to have been a lot more exuberant in its younger days generating massive amounts of solar wind and ram pressure, pushing away any debris that was near it. The other factor has to do with the other monster in our solar system, the planet Jupiter. In its early days, Jupiter is suspected on going on quite the road trip. First as it spiraled in closer to our star, and then later when it was yanked back in its current position by the planet Saturn. Along the way, though, its massive gravitational influence captured and flung debris all over the place. Between both of these events, well, there just wasn't enough material to form a world or worlds closer in 
than Mercury. The dream of Vulcan hasn't quite died. There is a coda to the story. There are the Vulcanoids, a hypothetical band of asteroids that may exist inside of Mercury's orbit. There is yet to be any definitive proof of their existence. But just in case there is a startling discovery made, the name Vulcan is still reserved by the International Astronomical Union for just such an occasion. I'm Sky Mar Thaler. Thanks for joining me on this Rooftops of the Solar System observation. Before you go, click that red subscribe button below, and I'll see you soon.